When you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, church, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will do. Give directions when I come. Father, would you please add your blessing to the reading of your word and now the proclamation of it. Um, we trust that your word will not return void. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. We've been spending some time in recent weeks mainly speaking to our church in kind of an intimate way of going to another level excelling as believers, as individual Christians, and as the church, excelling, going to a higher level in our Christian life. And we've looked at many aspects of that. And so today, today I want us to simply look at excelling through communion. And I'm going to focus on that word communion today because I believe the church has missed that when it comes to the Lord's Supper and the gospel as a whole. I think we have fallen short of understanding what it means to be in Christ. We commune with a lot of things as people and even as believers, even as those who have been redeemed by Christ, even as those who have placed their trust in Jesus. We often allow our flesh to rule over our daily lives and commune with a lot of things that we have no business communing with. That happens to us a lot. And what a sad thing that is. For when we begin to commune, think upon fellowship with things that we have no business communing with, the fallout from that is drastic and devastating many, many times. At any given time of the life of almost any church, you can begin to isolate areas or people or even families where they have begun to commune with something other than Christ. And you can see the fallout where that happens. It begins to affect their relationship with the Lord. It becomes strained and there's not fellowship there like it should be. It begins to affect their family, their earthly family. And folks, don't you think for a moment... Hear me today. Don't you think for a moment that what you do does not affect other people around you. It desperately, drastically, and radically does. Do not fool yourself and do not try to make yourself out to be the victim in those situations. You're not. You're the cause of it. When you begin to commune with other things other than Christ, it is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. 
So we begin to try to adjust this idea of communion and focus it on the right thing, the right person, which is Christ. This is what happened to the church at Corinth. Their communion began to be focused on something other than Jesus. And man, look at the effects of it. It was devastating. It affected the church in a very, very negative way. It affected their families in a very, very negative way. So I just want to just, just be real with you today. Let's talk about communion. Who are we communing with today? Uh, this issue of the Lord's Supper or communion has been a theological debate for many, 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 many years. Generations upon generations. What does it mean? You know, some believe in transubstantiation, which is basically that the elements become the body and, and blood of Jesus. Others believe that it's, that it's merely a commemorative thing. Um, that, and that's kind of often where the Baptists fall down on it. It's merely a commemorative thing. And it no doubt is for we see in the text that he says, when you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You remember the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. So it certainly is a commemorative thing, right? I want you to do that. When you look upon these elements, when you hold them in your hands, when you partake of them, you think of Jesus. You think of his, his death, burial, and resurrection. You think of all that that entails. When our deacons come forward in a few minutes and begin to pass out the elements, it'll take a little bit of time. So during that time, you think upon that. Open your Bible to the Gospels to where... It tells the story of the passion of, of the Christ. And you read while we're serving the elements. So you think about those things. And you remember that he is coming back. And he's coming back as victor of everything and everyone. You remember those things. Right? So it most definitely is a commemorative thing. But far too often we as Baptists leave it there. We forget the whole idea of communion. We talk about the Lord's Supper, the commemorative part of it, but far too often we forget the communion part of it. And when we forget that we are communing with the Lord Jesus Christ, boy, we miss it. We miss a beautiful, beautiful time together, beautiful time of worship, and so much more. Because when we, when we put aside our communion with Christ, all sorts of things happen. We see in the church at Corinth some of the things that were happening there in verse 18. Look at it with me. It's not just me saying this. It's in the text. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, now pause there a moment. They are coming together, called out to come together for worship, for fellowship. This is what the church does. By way of reminder, folks, when we gather together on Sunday morning, it is fellowship. This is part of what we do. We're showing the body of Christ. We get together and we hang out and we talk about our lives together. We see how each other are doing. Uh, uh, we pray for each other. We help each other. We do all those things. It's called koinonia fellowship. Fellowship in Christ Jesus. Communing with Christ, communing with each other in Christ. Okay? This is part of what we do. And he said the church has come together to worship, to commune with each other, with Christ. But that's not what was happening. I hear that there are divisions among you. What a sad state. Now we expect when we go home to turn on CNN or Fox News or whatever you watch and you expect to see division. For there's a big division between CNN and Fox. <laughs> There's divisions everywhere out in the world, right? You all know I'm, I'm for real today. You know that's true. You expect to see divisions in the world, but you do not expect to see it in the body of Christ. It, using the language of Paul so, so often, I think Paul was from Pender County, said it, these things ought not to be. And they shouldn't be in the church. Now, do we have division? Sure, things happen, don't, don't they? Uh, we're, we're different people. We, we have different backgrounds, different perspectives on things. But we are one in Christ. And when divisions happen, we deal with them. For the sake of the gospel, we deal with them. But when you're not communing with Christ, these divisions fester. 
And they get worse and worse and worse and becomes factions, as he said later on there. And that's an issue. For the church should be united. We see the issue of unity throughout this entire passage. Not only this passage, but the entire book, the entire Bible. We see where Christ breaks down the walls of divisions and brings us together. For crying out loud, he brought the Jews and the Gentiles together. Nothing else could do that. You want to know what's going to solve the race relations in our country? Jesus is. Nothing else is going to do that. You know what's going to solve all the other issues in our country, all the divisions? It's Jesus, folks. That's why you don't place your trust in government. That's why you don't tra place your trust in some political leader. Yes, you vote, and we always say that. It's a good thing. But don't leave your trust there. There's human like we are. They struggle with divisions themselves. We turn to Jesus. We commune with Jesus. And when you are absolutely consumed with Jesus through communion with Him, you will put aside your differences. And you will be one in Christ. You will begin to work through your issues. And you must for the sake of the gospel. This is... Unity, and unity is absolutely priority. So he goes on to speak of that division there. He said some are, are leaving others out when it comes to the feast that they were having for the Lord's Supper, which is a custom they would do. Some were using it as opportunities to get drunk. How far can we drift? How far does our flesh take us? And listen, folks, I'm telling you, you, you begin to, to let your communion in Christ with Christ wane, your flesh will take you farther than you can imagine, quicker than you can imagine. You'll look back in a year's time and go, dear God, how did I get here? How did this happen? And hear me, it could happen to any of us. If we don't, if we don't make communion with our Lord a priority, if He is not everything above all, and we spend time and commune with Him, it could happen to any of us. Quickly. This is the church of Jesus Christ. This is a church that's listed in Scripture. A book of the Bible is named after this church in a sense because Paul wrote a letter to them. A couple of, three actually, one we don't have in the canon. And, and look at the shape they were in. That quickly because of their lack of communion. So lack of communion with Christ was the problem. And it began to hurt the gospel. It began to, to break down the witness of the church. Y'all, do you think the world wants to look at the church and see the same thing it sees in the world? When they do that, do you think they're going to be attracted to the church, the body of Christ? Do you think they're going to be attracted to the gospel, to, to Jesus? No. They're going to look at us and giggle and say, they're wasting their time. They're no different than us. So for the sake of the gospel, we look at the issue of communion and, and we strive to have communion with Christ. A divided church is an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense at all. So we talk about the gospel. We talk about thinking about the gospel. I wonder if we could... Just those of us that are here today, if somehow God would grant us the ability to have a screen placed before us in our lives this past week, put up on that screen just for us individually to see and to list in order of time spent of the things we've communed with, thought about, focused on, I wonder what it would look like. I just wonder. And then how our lives are shaped because of that. I wonder how often this week we've just thought about the gospel, about Jesus, about what he has done, about life in Christ, about Jesus being our everything, about Jesus being our source. He is the vine, we are the branches. About Jesus being being the one who has breathed spiritual life into us, about Jesus being the one who 
made us alive spiritually. How often have we stopped and just thought about the beauty of Jesus? We probably thought a lot about the Carolina Duke game, I would imagine. Probably thought a lot about some basketball player being traded, you know, and all that went around that. Probably thought a lot about um, a new banjo that's been put on the market. It's a beauty, too. You ought to see it. <laughs> really, I'm going to leave it there. Our minds go in so many different places, and Satan knows that, and his minions, and he will do everything he can to keep us from thinking and communing with Christ. But I'm telling you, we pay a huge price when we do that. Now, am I saying there's anything wrong with thinking of those things? No. There's, those things, godly things, are things that are immoral, are God's grace in our lives, and we can use them for his glory. We truly can, especially the banjo. <laughs> can really give God glory with that. So I'm not, I'm not downing those things in, in, in that sense, but unless they take our mind away from Christ. Folks, those things are wood, hay, and stubble. They are temporary. They will not last. Only Jesus is eternal. And the gospel. I just want to, I want you to think about something for a moment. I want you to open your Bibles. Turn way back to the beginning of the Bible to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis, the beginning, origins. In chapter 3, a lot had happened up to this point. The fall of man, creation had happened. In the beginning, God, God created the heavens and the earth and goes on to tell how he created the animals and ultimately man and said it is very good, the creation of man. And then here came along Satan and tempted the two in the garden and they gave in to that and because of pride, the depravity of man as we know it happened. The fall of man happened. And here there was this mighty spiritual battle that was being preluded in Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 14. This is where God is there and Satan himself, the slimy serpent that he was, cruddy, evil, jerky Satan. I can say that. It's legal, isn't it? The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. That's why snakes are so creepy. <laughs> now listen to this. This is the first glimpse of the gospel. You, you think it's just in, in the New Testament? Oh, no. Look at it. I will put enmity between you and the woman... And between your offspring and her offspring, which is Jesus, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Look at that last phrase there. You shall bruise his heel. This is God speaking to Satan himself. You shall bruise his heel. This is speaking of the cross. This is speaking of, of what Jesus went through physically on the cross but look just above that, and he shall bruise your head. Do you understand what this is? This is a, a picture of a fatal blow that he was going to give to Satan on the cross. Thousands and thousands of years ago, this was, was, uh, was looked at and, and uh, glimpsed at. This is the gospel, folks. The gospel is not an accident. It's not something that happened because God said, Oops, what do I do now? The gospel is God's grace upon us. The gospel is something that, that is far greater than we can begin to fathom. And we treat it oftentimes like it's, like it's a, a lottery ticket or something. You know, I, I won this lottery ticket. I'm going to cash in and go about my life. I, I'm going to I'm going to play off all the riches I've got from this lottery ticket and yay me. But it is so much more than that, folks. 
Eternal life, the gospel, is more than a ticket that we get and we cash in. The gospel is life. The gospel is the glory of this magnificent holy God that had mercy upon us and made a way for us to know Him and be with Him forever and ever and ever. This is the gospel. All the way back here in Genesis. And every moment from that, all through the, the Old Testament, all the sacrifices, everything that happened, everything. It's not a book of morals. That's not the point. It's a book about the gospel pointing us to the sacrifice of Christ. Everything in the Bible, the greatest book ever written, is about Jesus. And we spend so little time communing with him and, and thinking upon him. I'm telling you, folks, if a church corporately and then individually every day of our lives commune with Christ, you would see a great revival happening. It, it couldn't help it. On the other hand, if we don't, you see the book of 1 Corinthians. If we were to continue down through this, this passage as we read, you would see where their mistreatment of, of a wrong communion caused many of them to be sick. Many had even died because of it. He goes on to say, don't even partake if you're not worthy. Boy, that sure gets your attention, doesn't it? Immediately we begin to think, well, I'm surely not worthy. I'm not worthy of, of this, of taking communion of, of Christ. Well, you're absolutely right. None of us are worthy in and of ourselves, are we? That's where the gospel comes in. That is why he crushed the head of the serpent. The gospel, so we can trust Christ and become worthy in Jesus. You are not worthy outside of Jesus. I am not worthy. Please know that none of us are. We are wretched, wicked people outside of Jesus. But when we trust him, he makes us righteous. He makes us worthy because of his sacrifice on the cross, because of his resurrection from the dead. And we stand sinless before a holy God because of this. Is that not worth communing with Christ over? This is what I want us to grasp today. So when, when the elements are passed out, that we get a picture of the gospel. So if you've never trusted Jesus today, here, here's what I encourage you to do per, per instruction of Scripture, to just watch, to just watch it. Nobody's going to look at you. Nobody's going to look cross-eyed at you or any of that. They're just not. You, you look at what is happening. You see that bread broken? That's the broken body of Jesus. That he went in our place, what we deserved, the wrath of his Father. That's a picture of the broken body, the wrath of his father coming down upon him. You look at that. When the, the juice is passed out, and that is a picture of the blood of Christ that he shed. Blood had to be shed for the remission of sin. So what? That was God's standard, his requirement. And Jesus shed that perfect blood in our place. You look at that. And it is a call to you. It is a call to say, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. You're only going to find rest in communion with Christ. Turn to Jesus. For those of us who have trusted in Christ and we're alive spiritually, spiritually you commune with him. You think about what has happened in the gospel. Think about it. Dwell on it. Be a in awe over it. Be amazed by the gospel. Put everything else aside. Don't you dare allow Satan or the world or the flesh to steal this privilege of thinking and communion, communing with Christ today. Think upon Jesus. Amen? We're going to have just a, a few moments of of thinking upon Christ. And we'll call it our invitation time, and I'll be down front. If you've never trusted Jesus today, why not? Why not today? Today is the day of salvation. You just simply say, Father, have mercy on me. Save me. Save me. I trust you. I trust Jesus what you did. And he will do that. And you can, you can share that with me. That would be beautiful. 
Maybe you want to come down and, and say, Lord, I, I've not thought of you lately. Oh, God, forgive me. I've, I've spent too much time thinking of somebody wronging me or, or how I've wronged someone and haven't dealt with it or whatever. Forgive me, Lord. Maybe there's somebody you need to forgive for some reason. We need to do that. Examine ourselves to see where we are so we can come to the, the table ready communing with Christ. Father,